Assalamu alaikum, I'm Professor Dr. Haider Jawad Mubarak. This is a presentation to practical aspects of the parotid region and suboccipital triangle. Starting with the parotid gland, the parotid gland is a serous salivary gland. Of course, some of the salivary glands are mucus, others are mixed mucus and serous, but the parotid gland is a purely serous salivary gland. Its shape is just like an inverted pyramid with the apex below and the base above. It lies between the mandible and the sternomastoid muscle. In this position between the angle of the mandible and the mastoid process, we have said in the previous session that the investing deep cervical fascia is splitted to enclose the parotid gland in the region between the angle of the mandible and mastoid process. And we have shown you this figure that the investing deep cervical fascia in this region between the angle of the mandible and mastoid process forms superficial and deep lamina surrounding the parotid gland. The superficial lamina is attached to the zygomatic arch where the deep lamina form the stylomandibular ligament that extends between the styloid process and the mandible. Actually, the uh, parotid region containing the parotid gland is limited above by the zygomatic arch, limited below by the lower border of the mandible, limited anteriorly by this muscle covering the mandible, which is called masseter muscle, and the parotid region is limited posteriorly by the external ear and external ear canal and the sternomastoid. Inside the substance of parotid uh, gland, you have the facial nerve inside the substance of uh, this gland. The facial nerve project, which is the first, uh, seventh uh, cranial nerve, the facial nerve project from a stylomastoid foramen. This figure shows you that this is the styloid process, this is the mastoid process, and in between them, this is the position of stylomastoid foramen. Uh, the facial nerve exit out of the stylomastoid foramen, then the facial nerve pass into the parotid gland from the back. The facial nerve perforates the back of parotid gland. And inside the substance of parotid gland, the facial nerve gives upper and lower division. Each of these divisions gives many branches that are five branches projecting from the interior border of the parotid gland, supplying muscles of the face. The five branches of the facial nerve projecting from the interior border of parotid gland are named according to the region where they are supplying facial muscles. The names are, as the, row, uh, the yellow arrow indicates, are uh, temporal branch of facial nerve, zygomatic branch of facial nerve, buccal branch of facial nerve, mandibular branch of facial nerve, and cervical branch of facial nerve. The duct of parotid gland also projects from the anterior border of uh, parotid gland and it runs forward on masseter muscle about finger breadth below the zygomatic arch. At the anterior border of masseter muscle, the duct turns medially to enter the oral cavity. As the anterior end of the parotid duct turns medially, it will perforate the fat of the cheek, which is called buccal fat or fat, and then perforates the muscle of the cheek, which is called buccinator muscle surrounded by fascia, and then perforating the mucous membrane to uh, open, uh, the duct will be opened then in the oral cavity against the upper second molar tooth. Uh, the section into the parotid gland, if you have a transverse section into the parotid gland, just like in this figure, this is the skin, superficial fascia containing platysma, investing deep cervical fascia, and then you can see the substance of parotid gland in section. In the substance of parotid, we have three structures which are from superficial to deep, facial nerve, then retromandibular vein, then external carotid artery. The facial nerve had just been described as it exits from the stylomastoid foramen, passing into the back of the parotid gland, and in the substance of parotid gland, it divides into five brooches, projecting from the anterior border of the parotid gland, which are temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. Now we'll describe the retromandibular vein and the external carotid artery. Retromandibular vein is formed behind the neck of the mandible at the upper part of the parotid gland and the substance of parotid gland uh, by union of superficial temporal vein and maxillary vein. The superficial temporal vein draining this region, which is called the temple or the time region, this region shows early the white hair and therefore it is called the temporal region, the time region. So the superficial temporal vein comes from the temple 
and the maxillary vein comes from the infratemporal fossa that will be studied later on. This superficial maxilla, uh, temporal vein and maxillary vein unite together in the substance of the parotid gland behind the neck of the mandible to form retromandibular vein. This retromandibular vein descends in the substance of parotid gland. At the lower part, part of this gland, the retromandibular vein, the vein gives posterior division and anterior division. The posterior division unite with the posterior auricular vein to form external jugular vein and it is shown here. This is the external jugular vein that runs in the superficial fascia. You can see that this external jugular vein is formed by the union of posterior division of retromandibular vein with the posterior auricular vein coming from the back of the auricle. The posterior auricular with posterior division of retromandibular form the external jugular vein. While the anterior division of retromandibular vein unite with the facial vein to form common facial vein. This is the facial vein coming from the face, uniting with the anterior division of retromandibular vein to form a common facial vein, and the common facial vein is one of the tributaries of the internal jugular vein. Of course, blood supply to the parotid gland is from branches of the external carotid artery, which are posterior auricular and superficial temporal artery. And venous drainage of the gland is via the retromandibular vein. And now, we will say something about the external carotid artery because its branches supplying the parotid gland. The common carotid artery runs in the carotid sheath with the internal jugular vein and vagus. At the, upper at the level of the upper border of thyroid cartilage, the common carotid artery divides into internal carotid artery and external carotid artery. The internal carotid artery ascends up inside the carotid sheath to supply the brain, while the external carotid artery exits out of the carotid sheath, ascending up to the parotid gland, as we said before why. During its course, the external carotid artery gives three anterior branches, two posterior branches, and one medial branches. The three anterior branches are the following. Superior thyroid artery, which is the first anterior branch supplying the thyroid gland originating from the external carotid artery below the hyoid one. Higher in this level, opposite to the hyoid bone, is the second anterior branch, which is lingual artery supplying the tongue. And more higher is the third anterior branch, which is the facial artery supplying the face that originated above the level of hyoid bone. So the three anterior branches from the external carotid artery are superior thyroid artery, below the hyoid bone, lingual artery opposite to the hyoid bone, and facial artery above the hyoid bone. The posterior branches are two. The first of them is, post is the occipital uh, artery, which is run seen in the apex of the posterior triangle, the occipital artery. And the second posterior branch is the posterior auricular artery supplying the back of the auricle. Finally, the medial branch is called ascending pharyngeal. It would not be seen here because it is from the medial side. It's supplying the pharynx from, as the name is indicating, ascending pharyngeal medial branch. The external carotid artery then ascends up inside the substance of parotid gland. And then the external carotid artery ends inside the substance of parotid gland behind the neck of the mandible by dividing it into two terminal branches. One of them is called maxillary artery passing to the infratemporal fossa and will be studied later on. And the other terminal branch is called superficial temporal artery that ascends up to the temple. Regarding nerve supply of the parotid gland, the parotid gland is supplied by the so-called otic ganglia. Actually, this is the first time that you are hearing the term ganglia, otic ganglia. Otic ganglia is one of the four peripheral parasympathetic ganglia of the head and neck. The four peripheral parasympathetic ganglia of the head and neck are the otic ganglia, that will be studied soon. It lies in the infratemporal fossa, uh, deep to the mandible, near the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. The other parasympathetic peripheral ganglia is pterygopalatine ganglia, that is lying, lying here near the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve and the pterygopalatine fossa deeper to the pterygomaxillary fissure that had been described with the sessions of the skull. And the fourth parasympathetic peripheral ganglia is the submandibular ganglia 
supplying the submandibular, la submandibular salivary gland lying deep to the mandible. And finally, the fourth peripheral parasympathetic ganglia of the, of the head and neck is the ciliary ganglia lying in the orbit. So we have four parasympathetic peripheral ganglia in the head and neck, ciliary ganglia, submandibular ganglia, pterygopalatine ganglia, and otic ganglia that will be studied today uh, as it supplies the parasympathetic fibers to the parotid gland. Actually, as I said, the otic ganglia is near the mandibular branch of uh, trigeminal nerve in the infratemporal fossa, as we had shown you here. Parasympathetic fiber to the otic ganglia comes from the inferior salivary, salivatory nucleus and the medulla that have been discussed with sections in the medulla and neuroanatomy. Axons of uh, parasympathetic neurons of the inferior salivary, salivatory nuclei pass with the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the nanocranial nerve, and these fibers of the, par the axons of the inferior salivatory nucleus then leave the uh, nanocranial nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve, as uh, it's running with the tympanic branch of a glossopharyngeal nerve. Then the axons of the inferior salivatory nucleus after passing with the glossopharyngeal nerve, then tympanic branch of the glossopharyngeal nerve, the uh, axons lie in the plexus in the middle ear, which is called tympanic plexus of the middle ear. From the tympanic plexus of the middle ear, there is a nerve projecting, which is called a lesser petrosal nerve. This lesser petrosal nerve pass uh, to the otic ganglia, and this, this axon is terminating in with, by connecting with the neurons in the otic ganglia. Axons of the parasympathetic neurons of the otic ganglia pass with a branch from the mandibular nerve called auricular temporal nerve. This auricular temporal nerve is a sensory branch from the mandibular nerve giving sensation to the parotid gland. But also it carries the parasympathetic axons of otic ganglia with it to supply the parotid gland. Parasympathetic innervation to the parotid gland is secretomotor, it's stimulation, parasympathetic stimulation produce saliva excretion. Finally, the parotid gland receives sympathetic fibers also. Sympathetic fibers come from the upper cervical ganglia of the cervical sympathetic chain. The fibers, sympathetic fibers from the sympathetic cervical chain, from the upper ganglia of the cervical sympathetic chain, reach the parotid gland by running with the external carotid artery. Sympathetic innervation to the parotid gland produce vasoconstriction, and the vasoconstriction interrupts blood supply and thus interrupting saliva secretion. Regarding applied anatomy, the parotid gland may so show tumor, which is called malignant tumor. This tumor may injure the facial nerve and thus produce paralysis of facial muscles, which is called facial palsy. Other clinical point is that we said that the opening of the parotid duct is into the oral cavity against the upper molar tooth. And this is the opening of the parotid duct. You can see it clearly. The region between the cheek and the gum and tooth is called vestibule of the mouth. And you can see that the opening of the parotid duct is into the vestibule of the mouth adjacent or near to the upper second molar tooth. Here you can produce or you can introduce a cannula into the opening of parotid duct and inject a dye and then taking x-ray for the parotid duct and the parotid gland. This x-ray is called parotid cyolagram. Regarding the tumor, there is an important clinical point that I want to describe. If you want to remove a tumor in, from the parotid gland without damaging the facial nerve, you have to do the following. If you don't want to uh, cut the uh, facial nerve while removing tumor from the parotid gland, you have to follow the course of the external jugular vein. And then dissecting the parotid gland with the external jugular vein, with the level of the external jugular vein. By that, you will di dissect the gland with the level of the retromandibular vein. Thus, the gland will be dissected into superficial part containing the facial nerve and deep part containing retromandibular vein, external carotid vein. And thus you can remove the tumor and 
uh, being careful not to injure the facial nerve in the superficial part of the parotid gland. Now we will describe the topic of the suboccipital region and suboccipital triangle. The topic of suboccipital region is very important for a neurosurgery. If you want to expose the suboccipital region, first you have to remove trapezius. You know trapezius is uh, surrounded by investing deep cervical fascia with the sternomastoid. And after removing the most superficial muscle, which is the trapezius, you will be faced with splenius capitis, the second layer. After removing this splenius capitis, you will find deep to it semispinalis medially and longissimus capitis laterally, which is deep to splenius capitis. Actually, these three coverings of the suboccipital region is well demonstrated here. Here, trapezius is the most superficial cover with the sternomastoid because these two muscles are surrounded by investing deep cervical fascia. When you will remove trapezius, deep to it you will find splenius capitis. Then, when you remove splenius capitis, you will find semispinalis capitis medially and longissimus capitis laterally. Longissimus capitis is deep, just deep to splenius capitis. Removal of longissimus capitis and semispinalis capitis will expose the suboccipital triangle. The suboccipital triangle is a triangle which is bounded above and medially, superior medially, by rectus capitis uh, posterior major and rectus capitis posterior minor. The suboccipital triangle is bounded below by another muscle which is obligus capitis inferior muscle and the boundary superior laterally of the suboccipital triangle is by a muscle which is called obligus capitis superior muscle. Therefore, the roof of this triangle is formed by trapezius muscle, splenius capitis muscle, semispinalis muscle, and longissimus muscle, in addition to skin and superficial fascia. The floor of this triangle is formed by a membrane extending from atlas vertebra and the occipit bone which is called occipital atlanto occipital membrane in addition to that the floor is formed by the posterior arch of c1 vertebra of atlas vertebra you remember that the atlas vertebra is a ring like vertebra it does not have a body it is formed of anterior arch posterior arch connected by lateral masses so the posterior arch of atlas vertebra which is this one and the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane form the floor of this triangle, which is the suboccipital triangle. And of course the roof is skin, superficial fascia, then trapezius, then splenius capitis, then semispinalis capitis, and longissimus capitis. Content of the suboccipital triangle includes a venous plexus, which is called suboccipital venous plexus. This venous plexus communicates with the uh, inside veins inside the cranial cavity and thus uh, also connected with veins of the skull. And sometimes infection of the hair of the skull, uh, which is producing a follicle called carinkles, uh, that is infection of a hair follicle. This infection may be transmitted via the suboccipital venous plexus in the suboccipital region to the inside of the cranial cavity resulting in an infection inside the venous sinuses of the brain. The second content of the suboccipital triangle is the fourth part of vertebral artery. Remember in the neuro we said that the vertebral artery is a branch from the subclavian artery. It ascends up in the root of the neck, then passing into the foramina transversorium of cervical vertebra from C6 to C1. Then the vertebral artery exit out of the foramen transversorium of C1 vertebra, lying on the posterior arch of atlas in the suboccipital triangle. After that, the vertebral artery passes through the foramen magnum to unite with its opposite side, forming the basilar artery. And we have said that the vertebral artery is thus divided into four parts between the origin and the foramen transversorium of C6. This is the first part. The second part is the part of vertebral artery running in the foramen transversorum of cervical vertebrae from C6 to C1. The third part of the vertebral artery is in the suboccipital triangle. It lies 
medially and upward on the posterior arch of C1 vertebra. And the fourth part of vertebral artery run in the foramen magnum, entering the posterior cranial fossa, uniting with the opposite vertebral artery to form the basilar artery. So we said that the vertebral artery is from the fourth part. And so the third part of the vertebral artery is seen in the suboccipital triangle, uh, exit out of the foramen transversorium of C1, lying medially on the posterior arch of C1 vertebra, and then perforating the atlanto-occipital, the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane to enter the cranial cavity via the foramen magnum. The third content of the suboccipital triangle is the dorsal ramus of C1 nerve, which is called suboccipital nerve. You know, this is a dorsal ramus, not ventral ramus. Uh, it runs uh, uh, between the vertebral artery and the posterior arch of C1 vertebra, posterior arch of atlas. The C1 dorsal ramus is uh, uh, enclosed above by the vertebral artery, below by the posterior arch of atlas vertebra, and then it divides into branches supplying the uh, muscles forming the boundaries, the four muscles forming the boundaries of the suboccipital triangle. Of course, there are many clinical points regarding the suboccipital triangle in consideration to the uh, puncture, sternal puncture, occipital neuralgia, neck rigidity, and these are topics related to theory and you have to study it. That's all about the topics of the parotid region and suboccipital region. Thank you very much.